All right. Well, it looks like we've still got a lot of people coming in, but I do want to stay uh, aware of time. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So again, officially, welcome to everyone. My name is Anthony Salas. I am the membership and event manager. And on behalf of Welcoming America, I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar titled Overcoming COVID Vaccine Hesitancy in Immigrant Communities. Welcoming America leads a movement of inclusion, inclusive communities becoming more prosperous by making everyone feel like they belong. And we have over 200 members as part of our welcoming network that includes local governments, nonprofits, and individuals who are committed to making communities more inclusive for everyone. Through a variety of initiatives, Welcoming America provides members with support in the form of tools, resources, and an international network of peers. We believe that all people, including immigrants, are valued contributors and vital to the success of our communities and our shared future. So before we get started, just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. Um, as I said earlier, we are seeing a really big response to this. Um, this webinar has been uh, greatly received. In fact, we are sitting over 800 registrants today. So um, again, we're right now just shy of 500 people on the live presentation here. Uh, and we have a number of you joining via the Welcoming America Facebook page. So um, that is being streamed there as well as a different option in case anyone is interested in that. Uh, regardless of where you're joining, whether it be this Zoom platform or on Facebook, we uh, again thank you and welcome you for uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome you to the presentation. So, as part of the registration process that you went through, many of you shared your questions related to uh, the COVID vaccine, and I want to thank all of you for doing that. Um, those questions were shared with our speakers in advance, and um, they are. Uh, hopefully going to answer many of those during their presentations today. So uh, if you did pose a question in advance, listen, and you might hear those responses coming through. Um, if you do have any other content related questions, or if you need any kind of technical assistance, please use the chat feature where you're entering uh, your locations now. And uh, we will get to those as soon as possible as we have staff that is monitoring the chat area. Uh, the full presentation is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording, uh, as well as the resources that our speakers are gonna share with you today. Um, you'll have that by the end of the week. And now it is my great honor to introduce you to the amazing lineup of speakers who have taken time from their very busy schedules to join us today. First, we are being joined by Dr. Jane Najiru, who is the consultant uh, internal medicine physician and assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Community Internal Medicine with the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Tiffany Brunson, co-deputy of stakeholder engagement and disproportionately affected adult populations, vaccine task force communications for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, COVID-19 response. Rawi Saeed, Community Engagement and DEI Program Manager with IMAA, the Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association, and two welcoming network members, Emily Yaffe, Immigrant Integration Specialist for the Office of Equity, Mobility, and Immigrant Integration for the City of Char Charlotte, North Carolina, and Jody Stanley, Education and Outreach Coordinator in the Human Rights Department for the City of Greensboro, North Carolina. And finally, I will introduce you to our moderator for today, Aisha Lee, who is our Deputy Director at Welcoming America. And I'm now gonna turn things over to her so she can start our discussion. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today to discuss a very pressing topic. Um, when I got this assignment, I thought it was timely and interesting and put it on my calendar and committed to preparing a couple of days in advance. And since that time, I have had the experience of helping my own immigrant mother navigate the vaccine uh, protocols in North Carolina. And she's an immigrant to the United States. And the night before her appointment, she shared a piece of information that she got in her WhatsApp group about the um, 
brutality and ethics of the origins of the vaccine. I won't re repeat the rumor, uh, but she was considering not going to her appointment. And uh, I realized that this was an even more pressing topic than I had initially realized and was really grateful for this opportunity and particularly for the incredible lineup of speakers that we have. So with that, I will turn it over to the experts. Um, first up is Dr. Jane Najeru. Um, she's gonna share some of her insights uh, from her experience being an internist in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Najeru. All right, thank you, Aisha. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, great. So uh, my name is Jane Jero and um, I live and work here in Rochester, Minnesota and we're freezing. It's, it's about, it feels about two degrees out now, but it's like 20 degrees warmer than it was yesterday. So um, I was born and raised in Kenya and I attended medical school at the University of Nairobi and then moved over here where I did my residency fellowship and now work in the division of community internal medicine. So I spend most of my time really seeing patients but I also do some research in health disparities in a variety of areas, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and I focus really on those that affect minority groups, especially immigrants, refugees, and patients who have limited English proficiency. And I've done this using two approaches, some practice-based research, but what I really enjoy is doing community-based research. This second approach, which we call community-based participatory research is unique in, identity, in that we work as medics, we work together with communities as equal partners in identifying health priorities and how to address them. And as you can imagine, since March of last year, our focus has really been on COVID-19. Initially it was prevention, management, and now our focus is really on COVID-19 vaccine. And so when I was invited to talk about vaccine hesitancy, I realized just how important this is. In my practice, I, I see patients longitudinally. So I, have, I am the primary care provider. I see them you know, for over years and go through life events with them. And therefore I have the opportunity often to discuss vaccines with patients you know, for pneumonia, for influenza, for shingles. And I realize that vaccines are a very important tool that are available now for us to prevent disease. I'm grateful for the organizers of this meeting for doing this, and I'm delighted to join all of you to talk about vaccine hesitancy. Now, just to start, I wanted to recall just um, some important facts about COVID, which I think we, we all know. COVID-19 has really had devastating effects around the world. And just within our country, you know, 27 million cases, more than 485,000 people have died just in the last year. And you know, when you think about it, our communities have been disproportionately affected, medically, socioeconomically, so it's just been very devastating. But we have a lot of hope because we have vaccines that are effective and safe, and that offer a lot of hope for the world, you know, to, for us to move beyond this devastation back to some normalcy. And yet here we are talking about vaccine hesitancy, and I completely understand, you know, there is, there is a reason why, um, sometimes people are hesitant about vaccines and it's important that we're open and address these uh, concerns. I would first like to differentiate between, you know, what we call vaccine hesitancy from hardline anti-vaccine sentiments. And that's not what we're talking about today. You know, we, we know there's some hardliners who are few but very loud in sometimes just being anti-vaccine. But I think here we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the patients that I see here in clinic who, they're hesitant about getting the vaccine because they want more reassurance. There is hunger for more reassurance that the vaccine is safe, that the vaccine is effective, and especially in the face of so much misinformation. You know, every, every few days I get something on my WhatsApp that I'm like, what, this video or this other misinformation? So we know we see that a lot and hence the need for us to, to get reassuring messages about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. I've also found that there's a, a, a big desire for people in my community to know when they can get the vaccine. You know, every day I get questions, when can I get it? When can I get it? When is it available? So there is that, you know, hunger to know the truth, but also hunger to get the vaccine. 
Uh, now, as uh, Anthony had mentioned, there were a few questions that had been sent out um, to, for us to review before. And there were some questions that were recurring. One of them, you know, why, why should we receive this vaccine? Why, why should I plan to get the vaccine or have my family get the vaccine? And the way I see it is really um, four main reasons. One is to protect ourselves. And in a bit, I'll talk about the um, efficacy of the vaccine. So to protect ourselves, to protect our communities, you know, our families, but also to increase the number of people in the community who are protected, basically raise that herd immunity. Because when we do that, we also protect those people who, for one reason or, or another, say they, they are allergic to one of the vaccine components, cannot receive it. When we, we, we are all protected, then we protect each other. And then the fourth reason, is to keep the, the virus from circulating in our communities. You know, we've probably all heard about these new variants um, in different places in the world. And we know that um, th the more the vaccine circulates, the more it, the, the, the virus, I mean, circulates, the more it learns how to, to change and, and new variants develop. So if we can stop it in its track, then it won't learn how to develop new variants and we can stop uh, that process. So the other big question, how effective is this vaccine? You know, like for all medications we use and that go through um, the FDA process of getting approved, large studies were done to see that these vaccines were safe and effective. And for the two that are um, licensed here, that, that, we, that are approved for use here in the United States, studies, initial studies included more than 70,000 people when you combine the two. You know, there were 43,000 people for the Pfizer vaccine and about 30,000 people for the Moderna vaccine. And like for, for most medications, when they're getting tested, you know, they divided these people into two groups. Half of them received the vaccine and the other half did not. They received placebo, something that looked like the vaccine but was not the vaccine. And then they followed them over time. And in the end, the Pfizer vaccine was 95% had a 95% efficacy rate and the Moderna vaccine had a 94% uh, efficacy rate, which means that about 95% of the people who got the vaccine were protected from an infection with the COVID-19 virus. But besides this, and also just as important is that cases of severe infection with COVID-19 were much lower among those who received the vaccine. So that even if you, if you got sick, it would be, less serious, less likely to land you into the hospital or into the ICU. And they'd also looked specifically, you know, what was the, the vaccine efficacy similar in all the groups, you know, by age, by sex, by race, ethnicity, you know, things like the, whether people were obese or not, their BMI, or they had other coexisting medical conditions like diabetes or heart disease. And they found that it, was, it had similar efficacy. Another question that I came across was, are the vaccine, were the vaccines developed too fast? And you know, it's, it's very impressive how the world came together, bringing in resources, money to just get this done. And I can assure you, it was not done too fast for safety. There were some things that were fast tracked, but that's what you would consider the paperwork, you know, the regulatory steps. Studies take a lot of time usually because there's a lot of regulation that has to go through. Funding takes time to get. Data analysis takes time to be done. Submission to the FDA for approval takes time. So these are the paperwork items that were done fast. But the conduct of the trials themselves, including how patients were enrolled or uh, how they were followed up, how events that occurred were captured, that was executed very well. That was not fast tracked. And, and that gives us a sense that, um, you know, they're safe. So um, I'm going to stop there because I know we have questions and answers um, session coming up. Um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Najeru. Um, I'd like to hear next from Dr. Tiffany Brunson, who is joining us from the CDC COVID-19 uh, vaccine task force, and she specializes in stakeholder communications. So I'm gonna ask her to share her content and then we'll have a little discussion between Dr. Nigeria and Dr. Brunson.
Okay, can you can you all hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have a short presentation for you today, um, highlighting the importance of making sure health information um, and materials and messages are clear, tailored, and accessible. Uh, next slide. So if, if there's nothing else you remember um, uh, from this presentation, I'd like you to remember these five messages. You can help stop the pandemic by getting a COVID-19 vaccine when it's available to you. Um, COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective, um, and COVID-19 vaccines will be free for you. After COVID-19 vaccination, you may have some side effects. These are normal signs that your body is building protection and you will still need to wear a mask and socially distance after getting each shot of the vaccine. Next slide. Everyone has been affected by the pandemic. Um, however, communities of color have been hit particularly hard. Um, this, this table really pulls data. It's from February 12th, it can be accessed on our CDC website. And it shows basically that in addition to the greater likelihood of contracting COVID-19, um, there's also an increased likelihood of um, being hospitalized and, and dying for Hispanic and Latinos, uh, the Blacks and uh, Black and African Americans, as well as um, American and American Indian and Alaska Natives. Uh, next slide. So it's our job to let communities know that it's okay and valid to have questions, um, especially for those communities that have been hurt by societal systems. Um, longstanding inequities in, in access to healthcare and social services, the um, ugly history of medical experimentation, forced sterilizations, uh, systematic racism, recent experiences with COVID-19, they've, they've really hit communities of color particularly hard. Um, and, and they all can sometimes result in low confidence in the vaccine. Um, we also know that for a variety of reasons, undocumented people and immigrants may be afraid to get vaccinated. Next slide. Uh, we have ongoing COVID-19 related efforts that are focused on building trust, um, improving our communications um, and tools and resources, and ultimately building vaccine confidence. Um, you know, vaccine confidence is really, uh, it's complex. Uh, we, we define vaccine confidence as the trust that the public and, con um, and constituents, right, such as parents, patients, providers, uh, that they have in the recommended vaccines, the, the providers who administer the vaccine vaccines, the processes and policies that lead to vaccine development, licensure, um, manufacturing, as well as the recommendations for actual use of the vaccine. So this foundation of trust is really, really critical when we're talking about vaccine confidence. Um, next slide. A uh, CDC's effort to build vaccine confidence and conduct outreach are under um, what we call the vaccinate with confidence strategy. It promotes confidence and uptake in COVID-19 vaccines in the US um, among critical and uh, priority populations with a focus on three pillars, uh, reinforcing trust, empowering healthcare personnel, including community health workers and engaging communities and individuals. Next slide. Uh, recent polls from the Kaiser Family Foundation showed that um, while the number of people willing to receive a COVID-19 vaccine is increasing, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and there are a lot of factors influencing people's acceptance of the vaccine, right? So for example, you know, is it safe? Is it free? How well does it work? Um, and, and confidence in vaccines can change really depending depending on what's going on. Uh, a person may refuse to get vaccinated, but when they hear that millions are getting vaccinated safely, they move more into kind of this passive acceptance. Um, and there are also multiple things that we can do to develop tailored vaccine confidence promotion strategies for different populations. Next slide. 
Um, so this slide is um, particularly important. Our CDC website has a lot of information. Uh, we work hard to make the information timely, reliable, accessible for all people. Uh, this is this right here is the homepage of our CDC vaccine consumer page. We have it available in both English and Spanish. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to um, uh, is uh, in the corner, there's the ability to select the state that you live in and learn more um, at the kind of state um, state level. Next slide. Let's see. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm sorry there. Um, so we have several audience specific uh, communication toolkits to help promote COVID-19 vaccine. Um, these include uh, toolkits for CBOs and FBOs, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. We have toolkits related to uh, medical centers and pharmacies, clinicians, uh, long-term care facilities, as well as essential workers. And so our toolkits really um, contain a variety of resources, which include key messages, slide decks, FAQs, flyers. And so over the next few slides, I really want to dig in a little deeper into many of the resources and how, how they can be utilized. Um, next slide. So, you know, we provide uh, part of the toolkit, we provide PowerPoint slide decks. They cover basic information about COVID-19. Um, these can be used for informational meetings within your organization. You can use all or part of them. You can use part of the, the set. You can include your own organization's information. We've provided some printable key messages, FAQs about the COVID-19 vaccine, um, which include uh, messaging about how COVID-19 vaccinations can help stop the pandemic. Uh, next slide. Um, there's also customizable letters, which can be modified as needed, shared with your target audience. Uh, many of the toolkits contain newsletter style blurb content that can be widely distributed, uh, you know, as an article, e-newsletter, or hard copy handouts. We have them available in Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, simplified Chinese. Um, we've also recently released a photo novella in low English proficiency. It's a, it's a nice little tool. This is a comic book style graphic. It tells the story of a uh, daycare worker, a daycare worker's decision to get vaccinated. It's available um, in English and Spanish, and it could really be a nice resource to um, promote COVID-19 vaccination in your communities. Um, we also have some pre-scripted social media messages with several uh, portrait images and text messages. Uh, the messages and images are for use on the various social media channels, such as you know Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, in um, and can be used with um, our handle. Uh, we have a hashtag sleeve up, or you know, you can um, use it uh, with your own handle. Next slide. I feel like some of our slides are, are getting thrown off here. Um, we also have a plain language fact sheet, uh, which um, it really provides information about COVID-19 and vaccines. Uh, messages here really emphasize that um, vaccines are one of the tools that we have to fight the COVID-19 pa pandemic. These fact sheets are available in nine languages, uh, Arabic, Spanish, Korean, Russian, simplified Chinese, um, as well as Vietnamese and a, a few other languages. Uh, next slide. We also have printable and downloadable stickers and posters. Um, you know, the stickers are available. There are four different versions to choose from. You know, what we've been encouraging uh, folks, whether it's our essential worker community community-based organizations is, you know, when you get your vaccine, uh, you know, um, take a picture with the sticker, post it to your social media accounts to really share that folks are getting vaccinated. We also have posters, numerous posters available uh, with the CDC logo, or you can utilize your own organization's logo on there. Um, and they, they display and highlight uh, folks from, you know, either various different essential worker groups and different types of people. Um, next slide. Um, so, you know, as we receive uh, feedback from our partners and the communities we serve, we're updating and adapting our materials 
Um, and, and we have a few resources right now in the works. We're working on Matt articles. Uh, the goal here is to kind of share, share real stories, um, you know, real stories from individuals as well as uh, debunking some of the myths. There's a, a lot of focus on trying to uh, correct um, misinformation. Um, and we have do documents in development explaining um, differences in vaccines um, as well as how-to guides. Uh, next slide. Right. So, you know, in closing, I, I guess, you know, I opened by saying if there's nothing you take away and I'm closing uh, with some very similar remarks. Right. So the COVID-19 vaccine is an important prevention tool for stopping COVID-19, for stopping this pandemic. Um, you are at the forefront. You guys are on the front lines of helping to keep our communities safe. Um, you can help the communities disproportionately affected by COVID-19 feel confident and safe in their decision to get vaccinated. And you know, we at the CDC, we have resources and tools to help you do that. Um, so with that, I will end um, uh, my, my presentation here and uh, uh, hand it back over to you, Isha. Thank you so much, Drs. Brunson and Najiru. Um, I'm gonna ask the two of you to uh, take some of our more medical and scientific and stakeholder-based questions, and then we'll move on to um, the rest of our wonderful presenters today. Um, a theme in the questions that folks submitted in advance was the ingredients of the vaccine and uh, how it works exactly, especially with regard to um, religious practices and dietary and allergy restrictions. Um, I'm wondering how you have encountered that in your work and how you would advise practitioners to address those concerns in communities. So I can take this one. Uh, so I have received that question too from patients, you know, based on religious uh, grounds especially. And one of the most specific questions has been whether it contains pork product or gelatin. And it does not. It does not contain any animal products. Um, and um, the other question has that has also been related to religion is whether it has fetal tissue um, in it. And the answer to that question is that the at least the two that are that are here that are available here do not contain any fetal tissue. Now, with the there's actually a statement from at least the the one of the group one of the religious groups from the Catholic bishops relating to that specific question, um, and it says that you know neither of them basically are morally compromised in that they, they don't contain cell lines that have got uh, fetal tissue in their design, in their development or production. Now, in the very initial work of um, what, of when they are looking at um, the de initially developing with the confirmative test that they do, there was a cell line that was used from, from the seventies that was a compromised cell line, but that does not, that's no longer contained in the vaccine. And so from the point of view of of the Catholic bishops at least, they say it is safe. And in fact, it's the charitable thing to do to protect your neighbor to take the vaccine. I hope I've answered that question. And oh yeah, it doesn't contain egg. Okay, so no egg, no pork, and no fetal tissue and ruled uh, acceptable by Catholic bishops. There's also a question of whether it's been deemed uh, kosher or halal. Do you have any information about that, Dr. Najira? Uh, yes, so part of my work, as I'd mentioned before, is we work with our communities here, and we have a large Somali population here, and we had recently a meeting with the imam of, of, of the mosque here, and, and more or less he said it's halal, that has been determined by Muslim scholars, doesn't contain any gelatin, and is halal. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Brunson, one of the uh, dynamics that we work with at Welcoming America is that facts change fewer minds than stories and personal experiences. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for practitioners and communities about connecting one-on-one, -on -one, sharing stories, what we're learning about sharing facts, whether it works. 
Yeah, so that's um, so that's a great uh, question. Um, you know, a lot of what we're focused on, um, you know, at our agency is really about um, sharing information and building trust, right? So I think one of the first things for us is uh, building trust, empowering healthcare professionals um, to promote confidence amongst some of their, you know, their the people that they're they're treating um, and engaging um, our communities and individuals, and I think part of that trust building process, uh, particularly with healthcare um, professionals, who are many times they're 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 trusted in their communities. Their patients go to them; they share information, so they've really got to be bought into the importance of um, vaccine. You know, the importance of of getting vaccinated, um, sharing clear complete accurate messaging um, if one-on-one -on -one, you know works in in those particular uh, situations and really kind of exercising that and um, and and taking visible actions to, to kind of work with your community as well um, to create clear and consistent I think messaging um, around uh, getting uh, vaccinated. Thank you. Um, so many great science and medical based questions. Uh, I'm going to just hit one more that I know is a concern for a lot of people and then we're going to move on, but we'll have more Q&A at the end. Um, both of you, if you can just speak quickly to what you're hearing about the vaccine for children and pregnant mothers, a lot of concerns we're hearing about um, well, it be safe for kids to go to school and the flip side of that is if the vaccine is so safe, why aren't they giving it to children? Um, and if someone is pregnant, should they take it? So I can at least um, start and I, you know, the I, CDC position right now um, around uh, pregnant women and vaccination is one to have that conversation with your medical provider. Um, right now, uh, pregnant women can get vaccinated. Um, so there aren't really any issues with that other than if there might be um, um, other circumstances that could complicate uh, the situation, um, you know, such as uh, um, allergies or, you know, potential for um, anaphylaxis. So uh, right now, you know, our, our messaging really is that pregnant women can get vaccinated and have those detailed discussions with your healthcare uh, provider. Um, as far as children getting vaccinated, you know, the as we did, as, as the vaccines came to fruition and, and they did uh, clinical trials, I mean, children just, they were not included um, in those clinical trials. So we aren't really in a position right now um, to say that children should be vaccinated. But what I will share with you is that adults, uh, if we do our part <laughs> and we get vaccinated, um, we can help protect our communities. You know, like even, even with schools, um, the amount of, um, or the, the levels of COVID-19, um, COVID that, that's really influenced by your community. So I think if we take steps as a community to, um, to combat uh, COVID-19, we can help protect our kids. And um, I will end there. Thank you. Uh, last thought from Dr. Najero, and then we're going to move on to Rawi Said. So I just said that, um, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is, um, was studied in people over the age of 16, and so it's approved for that group, and the Moderna one is over 18. But there are studies that are currently going on for younger children, I think from 12 years. So we may know more in the coming months, but I completely agree. If we uh, adults do our part, we'll end up protecting the whole community. And you know, for, for, the, for the pregnant women to be, it's also a point of thinking about risk and benefit because we know um, that COVID-19 infection in pregnant women can have fairly adverse outcomes. So having that discussion with your physician about getting vaccinated is, is a way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. We'll return to you at the end for Q&A for all of the panelists. All right, next up we have uh, Mr. Rawi Saeed. Uh, he is joining us from Frosty, Rochester, Minnesota. Um, he's a project coordinator for Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association. Um, Rawi, why don't you share your insights with us and then we'll uh, keep going with the program and get some questions to you in a bit. 
Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Again, like Isha uh, in introduced me, my name is Rauhi Saeed. I am the uh, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program Manager um, at the Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association. It's a, it's a mouthful, but uh, IMAA for short. Um, and one of IMA's missions, uh, by the way, we're located in, in Rochester, Minnesota, so, so it's, not, it's not warm by any stretch. Um, but, but one of our missions, uh, it, we've been founded in 1984, so we've been around for, for, for a while now, and, and it's really to help refugees, immigrants, and newcomers uh, become self-sufficient and sustainable uh, in the Rochester uh, area and Southeast Minnesota. Um, we, we work with, with uh, being around since the 80s, the, the organization has really seen an influx of refugees coming from different eras, right? In the early 80s, we saw a lot of people, uh, a lot of families coming in from Southeast Asia. In the 90s, we saw uh, Bosnia and Somalia. In the early 2000s, we saw a lot of families from the Middle East. And now we're seeing very, a, lot of, uh, a lot of families from uh, Myanmar, Burma, Anuak families, uh, all immigrating uh, to, to, to Southeast Minnesota. Um, we, we're very, uh, we, we haven't seen anything like the COVID vaccine or the COVID pandemic hit us as hard as it did. However, we, we are very fortunate because we live in a community that is very welcoming. Rochester has historically been uh, a, a welcoming community for a lot of people uh, from all over the world. But when we when we work with when we work with families, we we want to be cognizant about a couple of things, especially when we're talking about facts like like COVID and and things around uh, COVID. We want to make sure that we have that relationship built with families. We want to make sure that we really truly understand the culture. Uh, we want to make sure that the language, the religion, and misinformation is 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 really. Uh, especially the language and religion piece is really understood and that the misinformation is reduced to, to the best uh, or to, to a smaller amount. Um, and the way that we do this is by partnership. Uh, we, we're fortunate enough that we have so many partners, including the Mayo Clinic uh, and other healthcare institutions here in town, uh, such as Domestead Medical Center and others, um, that really uh, can help relieve that misinformation component of, of disseminating information. But uh, the way we deliver information is, the, is, is, is a huge task that falls on IMA shoulders because, uh, yes, while we do have language services and we can offer things uh, in different languages, that's not necessarily the most uh, efficient vehicle for, for misinformation, to, to reduce misinformation. Uh, sometimes it's understanding the culture, sometimes it's going into these communities uh, and really expressing and disseminating the information in a way that they consume it and that will be most efficient. And so um, there is a lot of mistrust and our job really has been in partnership with, with all partners in the community to, to reduce and minimize um, that mistrust and build relationships through, through uh, solid facts um, and solid relationships. Uh, and I know there's a lot of questions that we'll have for the question and answer, so I can I can pause there and we can uh, and we can go to the next speaker as well. So, thanks so much, Rob. Yep, we'll circle back to you. Um, we're going to move on now, uh, whip around the country to North Carolina. Um, Emily Yaffe is the immigrant integration specialist for the city of Charlotte, and she has some insights to share with us. Hi. Uh, so I saw a lot of questions about how to build trust. Um, within immigrant communities, recognizing the different cultural um, aspects. And so I hope this provides more understanding. Next slide. So uh, early on, um, when in North Carolina, they announced how they were gonna do outreach, one of the, the biggest worries that I had was there was sort of this first come first serve way of getting access to the vaccine for the eligible populations. Um, and then just the complication of how to use those systems when it comes to um, newcomers to our city and those who have English, uh, who are still English learners. Um, so I've, I've worked very closely with our county, which is the one who's in charge of uh, those operations um, and started conversations with organizations that I knew um, were well in touch with uh, seniors in uh, different immigrant communities. And we managed to pull together a community vaccination clinic and I, I really love in the article um, that I shared here that it says very quietly in parentheses um, because it, it wasn't the focus to do it quietly, but then we heard news later on about like what happens when you don't do these things quietly and then you have people who 
um, you know, have better access to the vaccine end up end up showing up. But we served um, during this this clinic. Uh, it was really amazing work from the county and the partners. Um, seven different language groups at a minimum, um, from Spanish to Burmese, uh, Hindi and Eritrean, just to name a few. Um, and uh, volunteers were there from each organization that partnered to do this to call no shows um, because you know, we knew that there was fear in the community and we did hear from some people that it was their children who talked them out of it or they, they just got a little worried. And so I think like that was an important note is that we had community members taking part in encouraging folks to, to get the vaccine, helping them find um, the place to go get the vaccine and then being that place of encouragement as well. Um, so it was really, uh, you know, asking, asking our community to help in the process. Next slide. Um, another way that uh, we're, we're suppo supporting building trust in the vaccine um, is doing COVID-19 art grants. Um, so this is in recognition that uh, community should be part of the solution and they wanna be part of the solution. Um, so we're asking folks to apply uh, to, to uh, with, with art that inspires trust in the vaccine, art that speaks primarily to, uh, to their community um, with, with messaging in their language. Next slide. Uh, and, and so we're still in the process, we're getting some early submissions. Uh, so this is a, a one in the Tamil language um, and it says, if we join together, we can all thrive. And, and the message is beautiful. Um, so we know that there's a lot of English resources out there or even if we translate those resources, those are helpful. Um, but also if you make community part of the process and, 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 and part of doing it, um, you've, got, you've got not only friends and those who help make the arts, I'm, I'm hoping that this artist will also be part of resharing it and spreading the word about um, the vaccine and creating trust in the vaccine. Um, but then you also show actively that um, it's not something that you're putting on them, that it's something that they're part of and building that trust in the community is something that um, uh, like they have, have control over as well. Next slide. Uh, the, the, the next grant that we're doing, and these are, these are both small grants. I hope that um, you know, with more funding that comes available through CARES Act or, or um, whatnot, that we might be able to do more projects like this. Um, distribution grants. Uh, so I saw a lot of questions um, in, in the chat about how, how do we combat um, the, like, the rumors that are going around? How do we build trust in different communities? Um, and, and for me, the best answer was uh, to engage them in, in sharing fact-based information themselves. Um, so this one isn't open yet. Um, we're still uh, building our toolkits. Uh, but using the art grants, so using the arts that are awarded, and then also using the multilingual uh, toolkits that we have, we're going to ask community members um, to reshare uh, this information as well. Um, so we're, we're being very open about it. We're saying whatever works best for you, if that's, uh, you know, doing social media boosts or holding um, community conversations or posting flyers and businesses that, you know, um, are high traffic areas. Um, we really wanted to uh, come up with ways that wasn't us being the holder of information with the city of Charlotte, but really um, bringing this out to, to folks to, to help them um, be, you know, be the holders of, of uh, building trust. Next slide. Um, so some key takeaways uh, with this, partnerships uh, are essential and partners need to be compensated. Uh, so this isn't an always easy to do, um, but uh, so partnering with the county, of course, was, was a, a primary step. And then um, really helping with opening up those conversations with our nonprofit partners or community leaders um, to show that uh, we knew that they were an essential part in this process. And then uh, to talk about what does, you know, what do they need to be able to do this, especially when we talk about our nonprofit partners, um, their funding likely wasn't specifically for, uh, when their nonprofit was funded, it was likely not specifically for doing outreach to, for COVID, which means that they're doing work outside of what they currently have funding for. Um, so especially with recognizing when CARES Act funding is available, we need to really think about how we're providing uh, compensation to those partners 
um, for doing work that we just can't do as local government or we can't do as well as they can as local government. Um, we have to ask who's being left out. This is true in anything, um, but especially during a pandemic, uh, I, I think had we taken, and this might have already be, been done, but taking a look at what distribution uh, strategies looked like, I think it would have been very obvious about who was being left out of it. Um, and so being, so saying, okay, we, we know that this is gonna be challenging for our immigrant and refugee community. How do we address this from day one? Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to be living in a place where um, working with people who are really ready to tackle that. Um, and then thinking about community engagement as the goal um, and translation and interpretation are tools to achieve this. Uh, so this is something that, you know, if, especially if you have the funds available, it's nice to be able to translate and interpret um, resources. Uh, but you also have to recognize that just because you have those resources in other languages, doesn't mean it's going to get out to community. So it, it, it makes more sense when you're going to spend the money on doing this, you also need to consider how you, how you fund it to do engagement. Um, without the engagement, it's just going to sit on a website and it won't get out to people the way that it needs to. Um, and, then, and then just again, because this has been a, a really hard one um, for, for me and I think for everybody is uh, a first come first serve approach. Um, we'll, we'll only show the inequities uh, that like of our system. So uh, you can look on, I think every state has a dashboard of who um, the, the vaccine has, has gotten to. Um, and you'll see inequities there. And um, it's, if, if we don't address that first come first serve approach, we'll just see those inequities continue. Um, so make sure that like working with partners um, to address that and really be nimble and, and adaptable to meet community where they are. Next slide. That's my contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, staying in North Carolina, we are going to uh, go over to Jody Stanley from the city of Greensboro, and then we'll have some more panel style Q&A. Thank you all. It's great to, to be co-presenting with my panelists here. Um, and we're just north of Emily in North Carolina, so I work with Emily frequently. I love to hear what she's doing. I think she wins most creative solutions, hands down, for the day. So thanks for all your work. Um, so we are a little city, about 300,000 people live in Greensboro. About 11% of our community is non-English speaking or limited English speaking. So it's really important to us. City leadership helped us develop a language access program through the city a couple of years ago. And they've been really, really supportive of our progress so far. So we're excited to share a little bit about what we've done to reach the community regarding COVID and the COVID vaccine. In, next slide. So I will say the one thing that helped us from the outset to establish a measure of trust and have some success in navigating COVID, um, which was unprecedented, we all know this, that word has been circulating nonstop. Um, we started hosting virtual weekly meetings with community leaders. These virtual weekly meetings were held on Thursdays at 10 a.m. without fail. They were very consistent. Uh, city leadership would come. The mayor would often pop in, council members. We also had medical providers and we had community leaders and local agencies, immigrant and refugee support agencies. These were really critical. And at the beginning, the agenda only contained listening. We listened to the immigrant community. And this was such a critical piece because we learned that some of our assumptions about what they were navigating um, were inaccurate. And we actually had to adjust our approach based on their feedback. One story that really stuck out to me, many of our refugees work at a local um, chicken processing plant. And as they were arriving at the plant, they were taking their temperature, right? Like most, most people were doing at the time. And so the employees learned that if their temperature was too high, they were sent home and wouldn't be able to work that week. So they started taking Tylenol before they showed up to work. And this goes to show, to me, it went to show that some folks in our community, immigrant and refugee, underserved communities, many minority populations, were dealing with COVID on a survival day-to-day -day basis, right? This has really hit some communities much harder than others. And some people were concerned about paying their utilities, paying their rent, keeping a roof over their kid's head and feeding a family. Um, so some of the, the work that we had to do on the front lines was to kind of rewind and look at 
how do we get information out there about food distribution? Let's make sure everybody has a mask and hand sanitizer and plenty of soap um, to wash their hands. We had to go back to those very basic levels and uh, make sure that people had their basic needs met. All right, if you can, next slide. One thing that came out of these community meetings was literacy. Um, love all the material that's been presented, um, but I know that we have this common shared concern, again, not just in the English learner population, but across even English speaking communities about literacy. It's really important that we produced something that was audio and visual, something that was easily accessible. A bunch of people have mentioned WhatsApp today. So these are a series of informational videos are gonna be in our top seven languages and we're gonna be circulating them on social media as much as possible. They can be used as a presentation at the beginning of a community meeting in virtual or in person. Um, the script was really important for us to develop in partnership with again, government, community leaders and medical providers. We did not do this in a silo. The script took a lot of time to develop. We talked about safety, realistic expectations, resources for uninsured, made sure we highlighted that. We professionally translated the script I, this is one of the things when it comes to language access, those of us that do this work know that not all translations are created equal. It's really, really important to have, uh, especially things related to health and safety done by a professional. So, um, and I'm going quickly through this because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Next slide. Okay, so as, in addition to the um, videos that we created, We've also been working uh, to translate the stickers. CDC created those orange stickers. We thought it was really important to stay on brand with what was already being developed, not in sort of conflict and create our own marketing material. We'll work with what was already out there. Um, kind of an outcome, a natural outcome of these weekly meetings is that informal um, presentations are popping up at institutions of faith and medical providers are being asked to come in and share information about the vaccine, which is really cool. Um, that we're now organizing future vaccine events in partnership with faith leaders. That's really exciting to me. And then we're also going to run a social media campaign featuring leaders and residents getting the vaccine. Because if you have that trusted face um, on screen saying, I did it, watch, you know, I've got the vaccine, it, people are more likely, I think uh, Dr. Brunson was talking about that, um, people are more likely to then sort of passively agree. Next slide. So our priorities throughout this process, number one, were to listen first. Um, because underserved communities and minorities have been uh, negatively impacted, not only by COVID, but historically um, through medical testing and other things, we feel it's really important to inform, not convince. Um, there is a myth that we encounter a lot in language access, that people that don't speak English are less educated or not able to make an informed decision. That is not the case at all. And so we wanna combat that and make sure that people simply have adequate information in their language of choice to make an informed decision, the best decision for them and their family. And that's the approach that we take with our staff. Um, we felt it was really important to stay in our lane. We are a government agency, not a medical provider. So we're not here to tell you what to do from a medical perspective. We had to partner very closely with medical providers. Uh, we really focused too on interagency communication. Next slide. So very, very quickly, some of the challenges were undocumented residents' fears about registration. This is, a, in my opinion, it's a legitimate fear and it's a concern that we weren't able to fully overcome. Um, reaching residents without access to social media, we rely heavily, very, very heavily on sort of that face-to-face -face communication. Our community centers are a huge part of that. Some of our faith partners are huge, a huge role, play a huge role in that. Um, we also have 150 plus languages in Greensboro. We can't possibly help everyone. Um, combating the myths, of course, that we've talked about today. Um, I would also love to see the systemic prioritization of language access across agencies. That is something that I think this pandemic has highlighted. And that's really, that's really all I wanna share. And then I'll step back and we'll take questions. Thank you so much. Um, we are getting close to time. So I just wanna let participants know that uh, we're gonna do a few minutes of Q&A and keep going over the hour, but we're gonna keep it um, uh, recorded. So if you have to drop off at the top for another uh, engagement, then you can catch this later and uh, 
panelists, I hope you can hang with me for a short Q&A and I'll get you uh, on your way shortly. Um, we talked a lot on this uh, webinar about fear and hesitancy and also quite a bit about access. But another theme that came up was casualness about COVID and the vaccine. So um, a theme that I noticed was that some immigrant communities in particular, because of their lived experience or uh, trauma history with cholera outbreaks, Ebola outbreaks, they just don't um, internalize able, uh, COVID as, as serious or as urgent. So I'm just going to pose that to the group and see if one or two people have something to say about that. Aisha, thank you for that question. Actually, I'll, I'll answer that because uh, I myself am a, am a refugee. My family and I came to this country in 1993. Um, and just talking to other Bosnians, so I'm Bosnian, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Bosnian refugee, um, from expertise, but uh, talking to just the community, you know, some of them, it's not that they don't have the information at hand, uh, but but they value the community input uh, a lot more sometimes than the facts that the, the mainstream community is trying to share. And so they'll see some of their friend, friends, family, neighbors uh, get sick and recover, and then they will assume that that's going to be their outcome. And so they don't take some of this stuff seriously like they should be. And that's kind of the biggest thing that we have been trying to demystify is uh, COVID is a case-by-case -case, uh, situation. And just because uh, mom or dad or cousin or brother or whoever uh, might have had it and, and didn't have any symptoms or was asymptomatic does not necessarily mean that this will happen to you. In fact, we want to be proactive, you know, so it's dispelling that type of, of fear that or um, um, information that they hear from the community uh, and, and having the mainstream community just as valuable as what they're hearing from, from the internal community, if that makes sense. Thanks. Um, another theme I wanted to touch on for uh, maybe one or two folks to answer is mistrust of institutions. Uh, for folks new to the US and folks who have been here for a long time, trust in government institutions and also, um, you know, church institutions, religious institutions is at an all time low in many places. Um, and so folks prefer to get their information through word of mouth or trusted sources. Um, have you found that to be true in your context? And do you have anything that's worked that you want to share? So I can share a little bit. I, I think through our weekly meetings, and those of you that work on the front lines of immigration refugee support know who I'm talking about. They're the, they're the bridges. They're those people that you know you can pick up the phone. They represent that community and they're trusted. And I will say they have been invaluable to our process here. They are known to work closely with the city. They are trusted. And so when there's ever a message that we need to get out to that particular community, that is our channel. That is who we go through. Um, and that's been the most effective uh, way to communicate. The other thing, when we did our video series, informational videos, we made sure to use people that were native speakers from that country that were also serving as medical providers because medical providers are trusted to some degree. They have more trust. So that's been our experience in Greensboro. Um, yeah, I, I love the point that Jody made. Um, I also think that's a good response to um, some of the questions about how do you how do you reach out commu to communities that you don't necessarily have access to right away, um, and it's relationship building. So uh, you know, doing that work takes time, um, and you know, it looks like phone calls and reaching out to people, and not always when you're asking for a favor. Um, and then uh, as far as trust building, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a goal that I put in front of myself. Um, I'm not looking, uh, I'm, I'm not framing things around the goal of building trust for local government. Um, I'm, I, I think that's something that just comes with time. It comes with relationships. It comes after people have um, gotten to know different services. Um, but if that was my focus, I think that um, that, would, that would be a really challenging hill to overcome. Um, I'd much rather uh, work with organizations and leaders who have that trust, and then we'll slowly build that trust in others as well. Um, there have been a few questions in the chat about, uh, you know, it sounds like lots of pockets of success scattered across the country, but what about a national approach? Are we going to see anything nationally around equity, around access, um, around undocumented or underinsured? Uh, Tiffany, I wanted to give you a chance to speak to that. Sure. Um, so, so first of all, equity is a major um, focus for 
not only our organization, but quite honestly, government as a whole. Um, we have um, various partnerships that we're beginning to stand up um, around this concept of trusted messengers. We're literally trying to get trusted messengers to the table um, in a variety uh, of, for a variety of different demographic populations, um, you know, which include immigrant populations. Um, we are, um, so, so, so there are number, numerous activities happening on that front where we are uh, funding partner and partner organizations to really work on, um, on this kind of, on these kinds of activities. Um, I think, you know, at the local and, um, jurisdictional level, right, um, there, there needs to be a bit more kind of, um, then, and I think it's happening, but more conversations and more kind of culturally competent, uh, strategic conversations just about, um, you know, just what are the barriers or, you know, do we, um, do we need to set up uh, vaccinations at, uh, at faith based organizations or the YMCA or, um, you know, just a few ideas about where people are comfortable um, and, you know, the, if the information exists, how do we actually get that information to them so they know that this opportunity is available? So there are, you know, we're continuing to have those conversations. We're meet, we're funding partners um, across the U.S. and in, in in various different pockets, um, and we're really thinking through that. And I think I forgot the other part of your um, question. So if you can re remind me of that second part, I'll try to address that. I just undocumented and un uninsured was the second part. I think you talked about equity and access. And mm -hmm. so, so right now our message is that, I mean, th the vaccine is available for all people. Right. We are actually working on language on our website that makes it clear that if you're in this country and you go to um, get a, a vaccination, um, you know, you may be asked to share uh, insurance information, but no one should be turned away. Right. So nobody should be turned away. Um, admittedly, that's kind of that's that's a difficult language. It's not very clear to everyone. We're hoping to further clarify that. Uh, but I think, like I said, for for those in the community and folks, you know, on the ground and really engaging on um, these communities, uh, you can kind of help facilitate that process for them. If you know where people are going to get vaccinated, you know, maybe you call up, maybe you figure out, okay, well, what will they need? Um, what what ID will they need? Uh, this person um, or you know, the, the, these groups of people, they, they don't speak English, but th this is what we need to do. So you can kind of help lay out that process for them um, to take away kind of some of that fear and angst about, you know, well, why are you asking me for ID? Why do you need to see my insurance card? Um, so, so the language it, right now is very clear. No one, no one can be turned away, whether they're um, insured or not. Uh, but we, as well as CMS, we're working on, on better um, kind of clarifying that. Thanks. Um, Anthony, I know you've been monitoring the Facebook live feed. Did you want to uh, pop us one or two maybe short questions and then close us out? Yeah, thanks so much, Aisha. Um, we actually did get a couple here. Uh, I'm going to pose one uh, that came in from someone uh, in Anchorage. Um, the question being, um, when we were talking earlier about first come, first serve, uh, and the question is, has anyone found uh, alternate means to mitigate the issue of inequality arising due to that approach just because it seems to be somewhat of a problem? I don't know if anyone can address, a, address that. I'll open it up. Um, the more often that we see um, community-based uh, vaccination clinics, I think that's going to be um, one of the strongest ways that we can address it. So in, um, in Mecklenburg County, at least, uh, we've had uh, almost 50 of those with more coming. Um, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure there's other ideas, but I think that's, that's essential. So we've got one that's coming up at a local mosque um, that I'm really excited about, uh, and, and we'll see more and more of those. I think for us too, Anthony, um, our county has now designated 35% of all vac vaccines to go to minority communities. So for leadership to make that decision, recognize that there's a disparity and address it in a, in a systemic way, in the way that they can. Um, it, it's, you know, it's definitely something. And then the other thing is I can say that our health system and our Guilford County Health Department are really, really actively working with minority communities to try to organize those vaccination events that 
Emily is talking about, it's very important that we not expect people to come to us, that we go to them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I'd add to that, I think that's a very kind of local effort um, because here too in, in our county, we have um, a community health uh, services mm -hmm. clinic that is federally funded and they've been receiving vaccines that's really just specifically for minority patients, a lot of uh, refugees and undocumented. Uh, patients who go there, but I, I don't know that there's a national effort towards that, but at least locally. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, we're seeing a number of questions coming in in regards to undocumented individuals, um, you know, and just that hesitancy and that fear uh, around, you know, even if they don't have um, some sort of an ID, can they get the vaccination? Uh, you know, is it safe for them to do that? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to share any thoughts around that or just uh, kind of give a general overview as to how that approach might work. So I can I can speak to what I think is happening locally. Um, I'm not an expert on this, so please don't quote me on this, but my understanding is they can get the vaccine. They're not gonna turn anybody away for the vaccine. The concern in the undocumented community is that it does require registration and I understand the need for that. I think there's there's contact tracing and other things that you know we need to have as a responsible community. Um, but it does it creates a lot of anxiety, which I understand. I, I know that's been the sentiment here in Green. I think uh, so. I echo uh, Jody's point. And one thing I would actually just add is it goes back to that piece of, of of what kind of relationship do you have with the community, right? So if they if they are trusting the organization or agency or individual, um, they're more likely to. They, I don't think the hesitancy will ever go away, but they're more likely to uh, uh, be participating in in whatever it is that you're requesting of them. Um, so, so I think it goes back to that relationship. Make sure that the relationships are solid and that there's a history between you and that community or you and that family or client or what, what have you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I tell you what, we could probably keep going uh, for another hour or so. Um, we have just, everyone, I, I wanna acknowledge that we know this is a huge topic. Um, there is a lot of information uh, out there and, Today was just an attempt to try and get some good, solid information out there. And so I'm hoping we did that. I think we did. I think this has been an incredible hour, a little over an hour. Um, if we were not able to get to your question, uh, please know we're going to make every effort that we can uh, to get responses to you. We are making a notation of all these questions. Uh, and so we're going to work after this to try and follow up on those. So. Um, you know, keep them coming while we're still here for a few more minutes. Um, but we, we're just really appreciative of everyone um, sharing their time uh, and sharing these questions with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up at this point because I want to stay, again, respectful of everyone's time. Um, all of us, all of you on the panel, uh, I just, I, I can't thank you enough uh, on behalf of all of us at Welcoming America, all of our uh, attendees today. Uh, it has just been incredible to have each of you joining. Uh, again, we realize how very busy you are, and it's just been a real honor to have you all join and share all of this information. So really and truly, thank you all so very much.